But I wonder what it would be like if somebody came to you, someone who you didn't know very well, and they said, I think God is telling us that we should get married. What would you, is that how you proposed, Andy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it'd be very strange, right? Um, it did happen to a friend of mine. A friend of mine was telling me this story. He was in college, and, and a woman came to him. They knew each other by name only, and she said, I think God is telling us to get married. And he politely said, well, I think I'll wait for God to tell me the same. And either unconsciously or consciously, he was very wise to the fact that oftentimes in Scripture, when God speaks to people, God does so to more than one person. And it's often verified by a group of people, not, not always just to an individual who, who has some kind of secret knowledge that nobody else has. An example would be God um, sending an angel to Mary to say that she's going to give birth to Jesus, but then also sending an angel to Joseph to say that this is what's happening, not just to one person, but to two. Last week we had, uh, when Luke was preaching, he preached the story of when Saul, who later became Paul, uh, had his conversion experience on the Damascus Road. And so he had his experience of the Holy Spirit um, being present, Je Jesus kind of this blinding light on the road. He has scales on his eyes. He goes off um, back to, he goes into Damascus. And it's then that Ananias comes, uh, who God sends, and verifies that what Paul had experienced on the road to Damascus was in fact Jesus. Because... <clears throat> When Ananias comes, he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. His visitation on the road to Damascus was verified then by Ananias' visit. And so God is speaking to different people in different places, but the same message that brings together um, a sense that this is a trustworthy message. And that's what's happening in our passage today. For those of you who are, who are um, guests, we're, we're still um, in Pentecost season, and so we're doing the Pentecost stories. And so um, we've selected a, a number of passages from the book of Acts, which look at uh, events that happened um, soon after Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish festival, but it was the time in the Christian tradition where um, we now recognize that the Holy Spirit came down on the believers during that Pentecost time, in case you were not sure what the word Pentecost means. Um, so in our passage today, there's a very significant movement in the church. This is a really important um, uh, point in the history of the people of God, and it's from Acts chapter 10 and 11. It's where God makes very clear through the Holy Spirit, that what God is doing is not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles also. Now, throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, through Jesus' ministry, through the event of Pentecost, there are, uh, there are like hints at this and, and um, indications that what God is doing was always for the whole world. That's throughout all of Scripture. But it becomes very clear here in Peter's experience, which we'll read about, that what God has done through Jesus is truly for everyone, and everybody is welcomed in. Um, the Holy Spirit um, didn't just do this through a secret revelation to Peter, um, but he speaks to Peter and Cornelius separately in the passage that we're about to read. He speaks to them separately in a way to bring them together for this sort of divine encounter where Peter and Cornelius will meet and Peter will share with Cornelius and his family about what God is doing, and then the Holy Spirit will come on that household, um, and all the people are filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're about to read, um, but as we consider the, this passage and this story, um, we need to remember that the main actor, that there's lots of characters in these stories, but the main actor here is the Holy Spirit. Uh, God is the one who is moving. God is prompting, revealing, and changing the way that people think about God and the world. So we're going to read all of Acts chapter 10, and then a little bit of Acts chapter 11. So it's a, it's a bit of a long one, um, but it's a goodie. Okay, so 
Um, this is about Peter. This is the same Peter who was a disciple of Jesus and a follower of him, okay? Um, so in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served with him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. And in it were all kinds of footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. And the voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This, sudden, this happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house, and they were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Now get up, go down, and go with them, without hesitation, for I have sent them. This is the, the divine intervention that God is, is bringing in, bringing Cornelius and Peter together for this encounter. So Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well known of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day, he got up and went, <clears throat> went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day, they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up saying, stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with them, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent, I came without objection. Now, may I ask why you sent for me? And Cornelius replied, four days ago at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter, he is staying at the home of Simon the Tanner by the sea. Therefore, I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. We're nearly there. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. In other words, God has no favorites. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. 
But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have just received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. There's a tiny bit more to this story, because this is where it gets complicated. I won't read it, I'll paraphrase it. You want me to read it, Jane? Okay, I'll read it for you. (laughs) Uh, First three verses of 11. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them. So the people of God are divided on this. Peter's had this vision to go and eat with these people, and he begins to be criticized afterwards. And then he he begins to say to to the Jewish people what has happened, and he shares pretty much in the exact same detail all of the vision that he had had um, before. But he ends by saying, "Um, when I finished speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads for life, leads to life. Um, Thanks for bearing with me through the long uh, reading there. But it's important to get the whole picture of what's going on. This is a very unusual thing to happen. Jews and Gentiles did not associate together. They did not eat together. In fact, the understanding that Gentiles could have a relationship with God, an intimate relationship with God, was one that divided opinion. And yet here, this story begins by God listening to the prayers of an outsider. Cornelius, he is the first character introduced. He's praying um, constantly, and it's um, God who comes and answers this prayer. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He lives in Caesarea. It's a big Roman city by the sea, a wealthy and important town, and he is a wealthy and important person. He's in the Italian regiment, He's definitely not Jewish. But somehow, somewhere along the line, he has become God-fearing, which is a term given to people who were not Jews, but somehow had come to fear the Jewish God, Yahweh. But he was not a Jew. But he was a person of prayer. He was a person who gave alms, who gave money to charity, gave money to others who were in need. Core components of what holy living looked like for the Jewish people. And so this passage is implying that although he may be an outsider, God hears the outsider's prayers and accepts his gifts of generosity. It's a really significant start uh, to the story to begin with Cornelius, because up until this point in time, most of the early Christians and the followers of Jesus were Jewish. They were ethnically Jewish, that was their ethnic group, but also they were religiously Jewish. But this is beginning to shift. Only a couple of chapters earlier, we have the the amazing story of the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but the eunuch was the epitome of an outsider, someone who had been castrated, neither male nor female, whose body had been marred. And God says, you're in. It's a story we can look at on another day, but it's, it's this really powerful story of God opening up 
who is in and who is out. And people keep being surprised by, the, by who they find are somehow in God's family. And so it's in full swing, this wider inclusion. And today with Peter's vision that God gives him, it becomes even more wide open. The angel came first to Cornelius. He's praying in his house in Caesarea. He sends his delegation of people then down to Joppa to meet Peter. And it's when they're traveling on the way down that God prepares Peter for their visit. So they're already on the move, and then Peter has this vision, this dream. God is orchestrating this encounter. And Peter's dream isn't just about food. So that, you know, you have this sheet coming down from heaven with these footed animals and birds of the air and different things on this sheet. Um, And he says, kill and eat. And for Jewish people to to eat these kinds of animals would have been uh, considered unclean and impure. And that's why Peter's reaction is so strong. He says, I've never eaten these things. I, I, I wouldn't do it. And God says, don't call unclean things that I have made clean. But actually, it's not just about food, because we see in this passage, Peter interprets, interprets this to be about people. Because when they invite him into Cornelius' house, he says, I came without objection, because God has told me not to consider anyone unclean. Um, and this is where the big issue comes. It's when they go to Caesarea, when they go to Cornelius' house, and they stay there for a number of days, and they have table fellowship with them. This is where their purity laws would have really been um, challenged, but the Holy Spirit had spoken clearly to Peter that you must do it. Because when Peter arrived in the house, he says, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for you, I came without objection. Now, may I ask why you sent for me? And that's when Peter asked him to, or, or Cornelius asked Peter to share. And this is the first time that this household, which is an extended group of people, would have heard the good news that Jesus Christ is redeeming the world and has been redeemed and it has been redeemed for everyone. And then before uh, Peter finishes speaking, the Holy Spirit comes down, it fills the room, and these outsiders, these people who are outside the people of God, excluded, begin to speak in tongues, worship God, and then Peter baptizes them with the same baptism that every Christian receives, that we all share in. And then Peter, when he returns to Jerusalem, that's when he begins to get questioned about all of this. And I find it really interesting. The question isn't, why did you baptize these Gentiles? But why did you eat with them? Both would have been problematic, but they really had an issue with, them having ta- with him having table fellowship with them. It sparks a big debate in the early church. Um, but it goes beyond the realms of their understanding of who God was and how God worked. And Peter and his companions witness that the Holy Spirit made no distinction between Jew and, Gen- Jew and Gentile, and so neither should they. So that's the story, but there's some really big things that emerge from this passage. And the first one is that God, through the Holy Spirit, is actively drawing people to God's self. God is the one who is instigating this. God is the one who takes the first move and begins drawing people to God. This is the grace that comes before. And it's this idea that the Holy Spirit, in all places, is at work in the lives of every human, drawing them to God's self. Um, You've got CSSM this week. The work doesn't begin with you guys. God is at work in the lives of the children. God is at work in the lives of you as leaders, drawing all people to God's self. We just participate in what God is doing, but God has started this. But a second point that comes out of this is that God's table is bigger than we realize. This story begins with people who would have lived really separate lives, who would not have had the intimacy of table fellowship but it ends with them seated together and sharing this meal. I don't have a perfect illustration for this, um, but there was something that came to mind that, for me, uh, 
relates to, this, to the emotion of, of inclusion and exclusion. I remember when I was a teenager, I was at camp at Avoca Manor, where Mark spends a lot of his time now. Um, and I had just moved back to Ireland. I, I am from Ireland originally, but I hadn't lived here as a kid. And so I came back as a teenager, and I had the wrong haircut and the wrong clothes. And I wasn't cool, like I am now. Uh, and I was so self-conscious and lacking in confidence. And I found being in a group of people where I didn't know anyone to be really excruciating. But I went to this camp, and I remember, you know, you, you go and you get your tray and you collect your food, and then you have that horrible moment of thinking, where am I going to sit in this room of people when I don't know anyone? Yeah, Jane, you're nodding. It's not a nice feeling. You don't... You're an expert, yeah. It's hard. And so I, I saw an empty table off in the distance, and I went and I sat at the empty table and began to eat my food. Um, and then after a while, one of uh, this guy called Scott um, came and sat next to me. And he was one of the real sort of well-known people at the camp, really popular and well-liked. And he sat next to me and asked me my name and, and, and took interest in me. And we had this great chat. And I felt like I had been seen and included and like welcomed. And then more people began to sit at the other table because Scott was there. And these were like the real cool people at the camp. And suddenly I was at the top table of the cool people without any, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I felt embraced and included. Uh, but to me, that felt like God's heart. What Scott did was to see someone on the outside feeling excluded and to sit with them and to eat with them. But I've also been someone who's dished out exclusion, and I've been the one to exclude other people. I'm really ashamed of one of these times, but I have this memory of when I was a young teenager, um, and we had a group of friends, and there was someone who had recently joined our group of friends, and a number of us didn't really want him to hang out with us anymore. And so our group of friends were saying, well, who's going to go and tell him that we don't want him to be in our group? And so I was basically, I don't remember if I volunteered or I was pushed, but I basically went to this guy and, and told him, we don't really want you to hang out with us. And his, his tears, you know, his eyes welled up with tears, and he walked away. And I still feel sick in my stomach when I think about that. Um, and I wish that I could go back and, uh, and open him in and include him fully with open arms because that is what God's heart is like. And we all bring our own stories of inclusion and exclusion. We've all experienced it in some way. We, maybe we have been excluded or maybe we've been included in very meaningful ways. But whatever those stories are, I hope that you hear today that the table is big enough for you. And in fact, there is a place at the table with your name on it. God's table is a big table. And this story of Gentiles being brought in is one that breaks down barriers and says, there are no excluded people in my kingdom, but all come in. God challenges the preconceptions of who is in and who is out. Those who are marginalized by religion and through culture, find themselves inside God's family. Not through their own doing, but through God's invitation. And that should hit home for us, because sadly, throughout history, and even today, the church has been a perpetrator of exclusion. We're not immune to excluding people. People of different gender, ethnicity, sexuality, socioeconomic status, the church has participated in exclusion. What groups have we excluded that God would include? Or what scales need to fall from our eyes to see the places where God is actively at work? It's a big table. And one of the things that's so clear in the New Testament is that people are always surprised by who ends up at the table. God's table is bigger than our table. And lastly, there's this idea that our theology which is the way that we understand God and the way we understand the world, 
is only meaningful when it's lived out. It's not about a change of mind alone, but a changed way of living. So Peter didn't just change the way he thought about God's involvement of others. He changed the way he lived and had table fellowship with them. It's a way of living where there were more places set at the table, not less. More people invited in, not less. More people included, because God is the one who invites them. And God is the one who invites us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these stories throughout Scripture that show your radical inclusion of people whose society has excluded. That you embrace people on the outside because your love is bigger and wider. Forgive us when we exclude people, when we have misconceptions of who is in and who is out or where you are at work. Help our table to be as big as yours. God, for anyone here today who feels excluded, may they feel your embrace today, that there is a place with their name on it because you love them. In the name of Jesus, amen.